This article was posted on the Fairy Internet on the site www.horsesense.no. It is believed that this site is maintained by the Centaur Foley, technical consultant to the Lower Elements Police, although this has never been proven. Almost every detail in the following account contradicts the official release from the LEP press office. We've all heard the official explanation for the tragic events surrounding the Zeto probe investigation. The LEP statement contained little in the way of concrete detail, preferring to fudge the facts and question the decisions of a certain female officer. I know for an absolute fact that the officer in question, Captain Holly Short, behaved in an exemplary manner, and if it had not all been for her skill as a field operative, many more lives would have been lost. Instead of scapegoating Captain Short, the Lower Elements Police should give her a medal. Humans are at the center of this particular case. Most humans aren't smart enough to find the leg holes in their trousers, but there are certain mud men clever enough to make me nervous. If they discover the existence of an underground fairy city, they will certainly do their best to exploit the residents. Most men will be no match for superior fairy technology, but there are some humans who are almost smart enough to pass as fairies. One human in particular. I think we all know who I'm talking about. In the fairy history, only one human has bested us, and it really sticks to my hoof that this particular human is more than a boy. Artemis Fowl, the Irish criminal mastermind. Little Artie led the LEP in a merry dance across the continents, until finally they used fairy technology to wipe the knowledge of our existence from his mind. But even as the gifted centaur Foley pressed the mind wipe button, he wondered if the fairy people were being fooled again. Had the Irish boy left something behind to make himself remember? Of course he had, as we were all fine to find out later. Artemis Fowl does play a significant role in the following events, but for once he was not trying to steal from the people, as he had completely forgotten we existed. No, the mastermind behind this episode is actually a fairy. So who is involved in this tragic tale of two worlds? Who are the main fairy players? Obviously, Foley is the real hero of the piece. Without his innovations, the LEP would soon be beating the mudmen back from our doors. He's the unsung hero who solves riddles of the ages, while the reconnaissance and retrieval team swan above, f above ground taking all the glory. Then there's Captain Holly Short, the officer whose reputation is under fire. Holly is one of the LEP's best and brightest, a natural-born pilot with the gift of improvisation in the field. She's not the best at taking orders, a trait that has landed her in trouble on more than one occasion. Holly was the fairy that at the center of all the Artemis Fowl incidents. The pair had almost become friends when the council ordered the LEP to mind wipe Artemis, and just when he was becoming a nice mud boy too. As we all know, Commander Julius Root had a role in the proceedings, the youngest ever full commander in the LEP, an elf who had steered the people through many a crisis. Not the easiest fairy to get along with, but sometimes the best leaders do not make the best friends. I suppose Mulch Diggums deserves mention. Until recently, Mulch was imprisoned, but he had once again managed to wriggle his way out. This kleptomaniac flatulent dwarf has played a reluctant part in many of the Fowl adventures. But Holly was glad to have his help on this mission. If not for Mulch and his bodily functions, things could have turned out a lot worse than they did. And they turned out badly enough. At the center of this case lies Opal Cowboy, the pixie who bankrolled the Goblin Gang's attempted takeover of Haven City. Opal had been facing a lifetime behind laser bars. That is, if she ever recovered from the coma that had claimed the pixie when Holly Short foiled their plan. For almost a year, Opal Cowboy had languished in the padded cell wing of the J. Argon Clinic, showing no response to the medical warlocks who tried to revive her. In all that time, she spoke not a single word, ate not a mouthful of food, and exhibited no response to stimuli. At first, the authorities were suspicious. It was an act, they declared. Cowboy is faking catatonia to avoid persecution. But as the months rolled by, even the most skeptical were convinced. No one could pretend to be in a coma for almost a year. Surely not. A fairy would have to be totally obsessed. The J. Argon Clinic was not a state hospital. Nobody stayed there for free. Argon and his staff of psychologists only treated fairies who could afford it. Of all the clinic's wealthy patients, Opal Cowboy was unique. She had set up an emergency fund for herself more than a year before she was committed, just in case she ever went insane and needed to pay for treatment. It was a smart move. If Opal hadn't set up the fund, her family would undoubtedly have moved her to a cheaper facility. Not that the facility itself made much difference to Cowboy, who had spent the past year drooling and having her reflexes tested. Dr. Argon doubted if Opal would not have noticed a bull troll beating its chest before her. The fun was not the only reason why Opal was unique. Cowboy was the Argon Clinic's celebrity patient. Following the attempt by the Bois Kale Goblin Triad to seize power, Opal Cowboy's name had become the most infamous four syllables under the world. After all, the pixie billionaires had formed an alliance with disgruntled LEP officer Briar Cudgeon, 
and funded the Triad's war on Haven. Coboy had betrayed her own kind, and now her own mind was betraying her. For the first six months of Coboy's incarceration, the clinic had been besieged by media filming the Pixies every twitch. The LEP guarded her cell door in shifts, and every staff member of the facility was treated to background checks and stern glares. Nobody was exempt. Even Dr. Argon himself was subjected to random DNA swabs to ensure that he was who he said he was. The LEP wasn't taking any chances with Coboy. If she escaped from Argon's clinic, not only would they be the laughingstock of the fairy world, but a highly dangerous criminal would be unleashed on Haven City. But as time went by, fewer camera crews turned up at the gates each morning. After all, how many hours of drooling can an audience be expected to sit through? Gradually, the LAP crews were downsized from a dozen to six, and finally to a single officer per shift. Where could Opal Cowboy go? The authorities reasoned. There were a dozen cameras focused on her, 24 hours a day. There was a subcontinuous sleeper, seeker sleeper under the skin of her upper arm, and she was DNA swabbed four times daily. And even if someone did get Opal out, what could they do with her? The pixie couldn't even stand without help, and the sensors said her brainwaves were little more than flat lines. That said, Dr. Argon was very proud of his prized patient, and mentioned her name often at dinner parties. Since Opal Cowboy had been admitted to the clinic, it had become almost fashionable to have a relative in therapy. Almost every family on the rich list had a crazy uncle in the attic. Now that crazy uncle could receive the best of care in the lap of luxury. If only every fairy in the facility was as docile as Opal Cowboy. All she needed was a few intravenous tubes and a monitor, which had been more than paid for by her first six months medical fees. Dr. Argon fervently hoped that little Opal would never wake up, but because once she did, the LEP would haul her off to court, and when she had been convicted of treason, her assets would be frozen, including the clinic's funds. No, the longer Opal's nap lasted, the better for everyone, especially her. Because of their thin skulls and large brain volume, pixies were susceptible to various maladies, such as catatonia, amnesia, and narcolepsy, so it was quite possible that her coma would last for several years. And even if Opal did wake up, it was quite possible that her memory would stay locked up in some drawer in her huge pixie brain. Dr. J. Argon did his rounds every night. He didn't perform much hands-on therapy anymore, but he felt that it was good to have for the staff to feel his presence. If the other doctors knew that gerbil Argon kept his finger on the pulse, then they were more likely to keep their own fingers on that pulse too. Argon always saved Opal for last. It calmed him somehow to see the small pixie asleep in her harness. Often, at the end of a stressful day, he even envied Opal her untroubled existence. When it had all become too much for the pixie, her brain had simply shut down, all except the most vital functions. She still breathed, and occasionally the monitors registered a dream spike in her brain waves. But other than that, for all intents and purposes, Opal Cowboy was no more. On one fateful night, Gerbil Argon was feeling more stressed than usual. His wife was suing for divorce on the grounds that he hadn't said more than six consecutive words to her in over two years. The council was threatening to pull his government grant because of all the money he was making from his new celebrity clients, and he had a pain in his hip that no amount of magic could seem to cure. The warlock said it was probably all in his head. They seemed to think that was funny. Argon limped down the clinic's eastern wing, checking the plasma chart for each patient as he passed their room. He winced each time his left foot touched the floor. The two janitor pixies, Mervil and Descant Brill, were outside Opal's room, picking up dust with static brushes. Pixies made wonderful employees. They were methodical, patient, and determined. When a pixie was instructed to do something, you could rest assured that that thing would be done. Plus, they were cute, with their baby faces and disproportionately large heads. Just looking at a pixie cheered most people up. They were walking therapy. Evening, boys, said Argon. How's our favorite patient? Merv, the elder twin, glanced up from his brush. Eh, same old, same old, Jerry, he said. I thought she moved a toe before, but that was a trick of the light. Argon laughed, but it was forced. He did not like to be called Jerry. It was his clinic, after all. He deserved some respect. But good janitors were like gold dust, and the Brill brothers had been keeping the building spotless and shipshape for nearly two years now. The Brills were almost celebrities themselves. Twins were very rare among the people. Merval and Descant were the only pixie pair currently residing in Haven. They'd been featured on several TV programs, including Kanto, PPTV's highest rated chat show. LEP's Corporal Grub Kelp was on sentry duty. When Argon reached Opal's room, the Corporal was engrossed in a movie on his video goggles. Argon didn't blame him. 
Guarding Opal Cowboy was about as exciting as watching toenails grow. Good film, inquired the doctor pleasantly. Grubb reins at the lenses. Eh, not bad. It's a western. Plenty of shooting and squinting. Maybe I'll borrow it when you're finished. Not a problem, doctor. But I've handled it carefully. Human discs are very expensive. I'll give you a special cloth. Argon nodded. He remembered Grubb Kelp now. The LEP officer was very particular about his possessions. He had written two letters of complaint to the clinic board about a protruding floor rivet that had scratched his boots. Argon consulted Cowboy's chart. The plasma screen on the wall displayed a constantly updated feed from the sensors attached to her temples. There was no change, nor did he expect there to be. Her vitals were all still normal, and her brain activity was minimal. She had a dream earlier in the evening, but now her mind is settled. And finally, as if he needed telling, the seeker sleeper implanted in her arm informed him that Opal Cowboy was indeed where she was supposed to be. Generally, the seeker sleepers were implanted in the head, but pixie skulls were too fragile for any local surgery. Gerbil punched in his personal code on the reinforced door of his keypad. The heavy door slid back to reveal a spacious room, with gently pulsing floor mood lights. The walls were soft plastic, and gentle sounds of nature spilled from recessed speakers. At the moment, a brook was splashing over flat rocks. In the middle of the room, Opal Cowboy hung suspended in a full-body harness. The straps were gel-padded, and they adjusted automatically to any body movement. If Opal did happen to wake, the harness could be remotely triggered to seal like a net, preventing her from harming herself or escaping. Argon checked the monitor pads, making sure they had good contact with Cowboy's forehead. He lifted one of the pixie's eyeballs, shining a pencil light at the pupil. It contracted slightly, but Opal did not avert her eyes. Well, anything to tell me today, Opal? Asked the doctor softly. An opening chapter for my book? Argon liked to talk to Cowboy, just in case she could hear. When she woke up, he reasoned, he would have already established rapport. Nothing? Not a single insight? Opal did not react, as she hadn't for almost a year. Ah, well, said Argon, swapping the inside of Cowboy's mouth with the last cotton ball in his pocket. Maybe tomorrow, eh? He rolled the cotton ball across the sponge pad on his clipboard. Seconds later, Opal's name flashed up on a tiny screen. DNA never lies, muttered Argon, tossing the ball into a recycling bin. With one last look at his patient, Gerbil Argon turned toward the door. Sleep well, Opal, he said almost fondly. He felt calm again, the pain in his hip almost forgotten. Cowboy was as far under as she could ever be. She wasn't going to wake up anytime soon. The cowboy fund was safe. It's amazing just how wrong one gnome can be. Opal Cowboy was not catatonic, but neither was she awake. She was somewhere in between, floating in a liquid world of meditation, where every memory was a bubble of multicolored light popping gently into her consciousness. Since her early teens, Opal had been a disciple of Gola Shuim, the cleansing coma guru. Shuim's theory was that there was a deeper level of sleep than experienced by most fairies. The cleansing coma state could usually be only be reached after decades of discipline and practice. Opal had reached her first cleansing coma at the age of 14. The benefits of the cleansing coma were that a fairy could spend the sleep time thinking, or in this case plotting, and also awake feeling completely refreshed. Opal's coma was so complete that her mind was almost entirely separated from her body. She could fool the censors and felt no embarrassment at the indignities of intravenous feeding and assisted bathings. The longest recording consciously self-induced coma was 47 days. Opal had been under for 11 months and counting, though she wasn't planning to be counting much longer. When Opal Cowboy had joined forces with Briar Cudgeon and his goblins, she had realized that she would need a backup plan. Their scheme to overthrow the LEP had been ingenious, but there had always been the chance that something could go wrong. In the event that it did, Opal had had no intention of spending the rest of her life in prison. The only way she could make a clean getaway was as everyone thought she was still locked up. So Opal had begun to make preparations. The first had been to set up the emergency fund for the Argon Clinic. This would ensure that she would be sent to the right place if she had to induce a cleansing coma. The second step had been to get her two of her most trusted personnel installed in the clinic to help with her eventual escape. Then she began siphoning huge amounts of gold from her businesses. Opal did not wish to become an impoverished exile. The final step had been to donate some of her own DNA and greenlight the creation of a clone that would take her place in the padded cell. Cloning was completely illegal, 
and had been banned by fairy law for more than 500 years, since the first experiments in Atlantis. Cloning was by no means a perfect science. Doctors had never been able to create an exact fairy clone. The clones looked fine, but they were basically shells with only enough brain power to run the body's basic functions. They were missing the spark of true life. A fully grown clone resembled nothing more than the original person in a coma. Perfect. Opal had a greenhouse lab constructed far from Coboiled Industries, and had diverted enough funds to keep the project active for two years, the exact time it would take to grow a clone of herself to adulthood. Then, when she wanted to escape from the Argon Clinic, a perfect replica of herself would be left in her place. The LEP would never know she was gone. As things had turned out, she had been right to plan ahead. Briar had proved treacherous, and a small group of fairies and humans had ensured that his betrayal would lead to her own downfall. Now Opal had a goal to bolster her willpower. She would maintain this coma for as long as it took, because there was a score to be settled. Foley, Root, Holly Short, and the human Artemis Fowl. They were the ones responsible for her defeat. Soon she would be free of this clinic, and then she would visit those who had caused her such despair and give them a little despair of their own. Once her enemies were defeated, she could proceed with the second phase of her plan, introducing the Mudmen to the people in a way that could not be covered up by a few mind wipes. The secret life of fairies was almost at an end. Opal Cowboy's brain released a few happy endorphins. The thought of revenge always gave her a warm, fuzzy feeling. The Brill Brothers watched Dr. Argon limp up the corridor. Moron, muttered Merv, using a telecopic vacuum pole to chase some dust out of a corner. You said it, agreed Scant. All Jerry couldn't analyze a bowl of vol curry. No wonder his life's leaving him. If he was any good as a shrink, he would have seen that coming. Merv collapsed the vacuum. How we doing? Scant checked his moonometer. Ten past eight. Good. How's Corporal Kelp? Still watching the movie. This guy's perfect. We have to go tonight. The LP could send someone smart for the next shift. And if we wait any longer, the clone will grow another inch. Yeah, you're right. Check the spy cameras. Scant lifted the lid on what appeared to be a janitor's trolley, festooned in it as it was with mops, rags, and sprays. Hidden beneath the tray of vacuum nozzles was a color monitor split into several screens. Well? hissed Merv. Scant did not answer immediately, taking time to check all the screens. The video feed was from various micro cameras that Opal had installed around the clinic before her incarceration. The spy cameras were actually genetically engineered organic material, so the pictures they sent were literally a live feed. The world's first living machines, truly undetectable by bug sweepers. Night crew only, he said at last. Nobody in this sector except Corporal Idiot over there. What about a parking lot? Clear. Merv held out his hand. Okay, brother, this is it. No turning back. Are we in? Do we want Opal Cowboy back? Scant blew a bl lock of black hair from one round pixie eye. Yeah, because if she does come back on her own, Opal will find a way to make us suffer, he said, shaking his brother's hand. So yes, we're in. Merv took a remote control from his pocket. The device was tuned to a sonics receiver planted in the clinic gable wall. This in turn was connected to a balloon of acid that lay gently on the clinic's main power cube in the parking lot junction box. A second balloon sat atop the backup cube in the maintenance basement. As the clinic's janitors, it had been a simple matter for Merv and Scant to plant the acid balloons the previous evening. Of course, the Argon Clinic was also connected to the main power grip, but if the cubes did go down, there would be a two-minute interval before the main power kicked in. There was no need for more elaborate arrangements. After all, this was a medical facility, not a prison. Merv took a deep breath, flicked the safety cover, and pressed the red button. The remote control emitted an infrared command activating two sonics charges. The charges sent out sound waves that burst the balloons, and the balloons dumped their acidic contents on the clinic's power cubes. Twenty seconds later, the cubes were completely eaten away, and the whole building was plunged into darkness. Merv and Scant quickly put on the night vision goggles. As soon as the power failed, green strip lights began pulsing gently on the floor, guiding the way to the exits. Merv and Scant moved quickly and purposefully. Scant steered the trolley, and Merv made straight for Corporal Kelp. Grubb was pulling the video glasses from over his eyes. Hey, he said, disoriented by the sudden darkness. What's going on here? Power failure, said Merv, bumping into him with calculated clumsiness. Those lines are a nightmare. 
I've been telling Dr. Argon, but nobody wants to spend money on maintenance when there are fancy company cars to be bought. Merv was not chatting for the fun of it. He was waiting for the absoluble sedative pad as he pressed into Grub's wrist to take effect. Tell me about it, said Grub, suddenly blinking a lot more than he generally did. I've been lobbying for new lockers at Police Plaza. I'm really thirsty. Is anyone else thirsty? Grub stiffened, frozen by the serum that was spreading through his system. The LAP officer would snap out of it in under two minutes and be instantly alert. He would have no memory of his unconsciousness, and with luck, he would not notice the time lapse. Go, said Scant tersely. Merv was already gone. With ease, he punched Dr. Argon's code into Opal's door. He completed this action faster than Argon ever could, due to hours spent practicing on a stolen pad in his apartment. Argon's code changed every week, but the Brill brothers made certain that they were cleaning outside the room when Argon was on his rounds. The Pixies generally had the complete code by midweek. The battery-powered light pad winked green, and the door slid back. Opal Cowboy swung gently before him, suspended in her harness like a bug in an exotic cocoon. Merv winched her down onto the trolley. Moving briskly and with practiced precision, he rolled up Opal's sleeve and located the scar on her upper arm where the seeker sleeper and had been inserted. He gripped the hard lump between his thumb and forefinger. Scalpel, he said, holding out his free hand. Scant passed him the instrument. Merv took a breath, held it, and made a one-inch incision in Opal's flesh. He wiggled his index finger into the hole and rolled out the electronic capsule. It was encased in silicone and roughly the size of a painkiller. Seal it up, he ordered. Scant bent close to the wound and placed a thumb at each end. Heal, he whispered, and blue sparks of fairy magic ran rings around his fingers, sinking into the wound. In seconds, the folds of skin had zipped themselves together, with only a pale pink scar to show that a cut had been made, a scar almost identical to the one that already existed. Opal's own magic had dried up months ago, as she was in no position to complete the power-restoring ritual. Miss Cowboy, said Merv briskly, time to get up, wakey-wakey. He unstrapped Opal completely from the harness. The unconscious pixie collapsed onto the lid of the cleaning trolley. Merv slapped her across the cheek, bringing a blush to her face. Opal's breathing rate increased slightly, but her eyes remained closed. Jolta, said Scant. Merv pulled an LEP issue buzz baton from inside his jacket. He powered it up and touched Opal on the elbow. The pixie's body jerked spasmodically, and Opal Cowboy shot into consciousness, a sleeper waking from a nightmare. Kajin! she screamed. You betrayed me! Merv grabbed her shoulders. Miss Cowboy, it's us. Move on, Descant. It's time. Opal glared at him wild-eyed. Brill, she said after several deep breaths. That's right, Merv and Scant. We need to go. Girl, what do you mean? Leave, said Merv urgently. We have about a minute. Opal shook her head, dislodging the after-trance daze. Merv and Scant, we need to go. Merv helped her from the trolley's lid. That's right, the clone is ready. Scant peeled back a sealed foil false bottom in the trolley. Inside lay a cloned replica of Opal Cowboy wearing an Argon Clinic coma suit. The clothes were identical, down to the last follicle. Scant removed an oxygen mask from the clone's face, hauled it from its resting place, and began cinching her to the harness. Remarkable, said Opal, brushing the clone's skin with her knuckle. Am I that beautiful? Oh yeah, said Merv. That and more. Suddenly, Opal screeched. Idiots! Its eyes are open! It can see me! Scant closed the clone's lids hurriedly. Don't worry, Miss Cowboy. It can't tell anyone, even if its brain could decipher what it says. Opal climbed groggily into the trolley. But its eyes can register images. Foley may think to check that infernal centaur. Don't fret, miss, said Scant, folding the trolley's false bottom over his mistress. Very soon now, there will be the least of Foley's worries. Opal strapped the oxygen mask across her face. Later, she said, her most vuffled by the plastic. Talk later. Cowboy drifted into a natural sleep, exhausted by even this small exertion. It could be hours before the pixie regained consciousness. After a coma of that length, there was even the risk that Opal would never be quite as smart as she once was. Time, said Merv. Scant looked at his moonometer. Thirty seconds left. Merv finished cinching the wraps exactly as they had been. Pausing only to dab sweat from his brow, he made a second incision with his scalpel. 
this time in the clone's arm, and inserted the Seeker Sleeper. While Scant sealed the cut with a blast of magical sparks, Merv rearranged the cleaning paraphernalia over the trolley's false section. Scant bobbed impatiently. Eight seconds. By the gods, this is the last time I break the balls out of a clinic and replace her with a clone. Merv spun the trolley on its casters, pushing it through the open doorway. Five. Four. Scant did one last check around, running his eyeballs across everything they had touched. Three. Two. They were out, pulling the door behind them. One. Corporal Grubb slumped slightly, then jerked to attention. Hey, what the... Uh, I'm really thirsty. Is anyone else thirsty? Merv stuffed the night vision goggles into the trolley, blinking a bead of sweat from his eyelid. It's the air in here. I get dehydrated all the time. Terrible headaches. Grubb pinched the bridge of his nose. Me too. I'm going to write a letter as soon as the lights come back. Just then, the lights did come back, flickering on one after another down the length of the corridor. There we go, grinned Scant. Panic over. Maybe now they'll buy us some new circuits, eh, brother? Dr. Argon came barreling down the passageway, almost keeping pace with the flickering lights. Your hip doing better then, Jerry, said Merv. Argon ignored the pixies, his eyes wide, his breath ragged. Corporal Kelp, he panted. Cowboy, is she? Has she? Grubb rolled his eyes. Calm yourself, doctor. Miss Cowboy is still suspended where you left her. Take a look. Argon flanned his palms against the wall, first checking the vitals. Okay, okay, no change, no change. A two-minute lapse, but that's okay. I told you, said Grubb. And while you're here, I need to talk to you about these headaches I've been having. Argon brushed him aside. I need a cotton ball. Scant, do you have any? Scant slapped his pockets. Sorry, Jerry, not on me. Don't call me Jerry, howled Gerbil Argon, ripping the lid from the cleaning trolley. There must be cotton balls in here somewhere, he said, sweat pasting thin hairs across his wide gnome's forehead. It's a janitor's box, for heaven's sake. His blunt figure scrabbled through the trolley's contents, scraping across the false bottom. Merv elbowed him out of the way before he could discover the secret compartment or spy screens. Here we are, doctor, he said, grabbing a tub of cotton balls. A month's supply. Knock yourself out. Argon fumbled a single pack from the ball from the pack, discarding the rest. DNA never lies. DNA never lies, he muttered, punching his coat into the keypad. He rushed into the room and roughly swabbed the inside of her clone's mouth. The Brill brothers held their breath. They had expected to be out of the clinic before this happened. Argon rolled the cotton ball's head across the sponge pad on his clipboard. A moment later, Opal Cowboy's name flashed onto the board's mini plasma screen. Argon heaved a massive sigh, resting his hands on both knees. He threw the observers a shame-faced grin. Sorry, I panicked. If we'd lost Cowboy, the clinic would never live it down. I'm just a little paranoid, I suppose. Faces can be altered, but... DNA never lies, said Merv and Scant simultaneously. Grubb reset his video goggles. I think Dr. Argon needs a little vacation. <laughs> You're telling me, snickered Marv, rolling the trolley toward the maintenance elevator. Anyway, we better get going, brother. We need to isolate the cause of this power failure. Scant followed him down the corridor. Any problem where the, any idea where the problem could be? I have a hunch. Let's try the parking lot, or maybe the basement. Eh, yeah, whatever you say. After all, you are the older brother. And wiser, added Merv. Don't forget that. The pixies continued down the corridor, the brisk banter masking the fact that their knees were shaking and their hearts were battering against their rib cages. It wasn't until they removed the evidence of their acid bombs and were well on their way home in the van that they'd begun to breathe normally again. Back in the apartment he shared with Scant, Merv unzipped Cowboy from her sealed hiding place. Any worries they had about Opal's IQ taking a dip immediately vanished. Their employer's eyes were bright and aware. Bring me up to speed, she said, climbing shakily from the trolley. Even though her mind was fully functioning, it would take a couple of days in an electromassager to get her muscles back to normal. Merv helped her onto a low sofa. Everything is in place. The funds, the surgeon, everything. Opal drank greedily straight from a jug of core water on the coffee table. Good, good. And what of my enemies? Scant stood beside his brother. They were almost identical, except for a slight wideness in Merv's brow. Merv had always been the smart one. We kept tabs on him, as you asked, said Scant. Opal stopped drinking. 
Asked? Instructed, stammered Scant. Instructed, of course, that's what I meant. Cowboy's eyes narrowed. I do hope the Brill brothers haven't developed any independent notions since I've been asleep. Scant stooped slightly, almost bowing. No, no, Miss Cowboy, we live to serve, only to serve. Yes, agreed Opal, and you live only as long as you do serve. Now, my enemies, they are well and happy, I trust. Oh, yes, Julius Root goes to from strength to strength as L.E.P. commander. He's been nominated for the council. Opal smiled a vicious wolverine smile. The council, such a long way to fall. And Holly Short. Back on full, full active duty. Six successful reconnaissance missions since you induced your coma. Her name has been put on the list for promotion to Major. Major indeed. Well, the least we can do is make sure that promotion never comes through. I plan to wreck Holly Short's career, so she dies in disgrace. The centaur foley is obnoxious as ever, continued Scamp Brill. I suggest a particularly nasty... Opal raised a delicate finger, cutting him off. No, nothing happens to Foley just yet. He will be defeated by my intellect alone. Twice in my life someone has outsmarted me. Both times it was Foley. Just killing him requires no ingenuity. I want him beaten, humiliated, and alone. She clapped her hands in delight and anticipation. And then I will kill him. We've been monitoring Artemis Fowl's communications. Apparently the human youth has spent most of the past year trying to find a certain painting. We have traced the painting to Munich. A painting? Really? Cogwheels turned in Opal's brain. Well, let's make sure we get to it before he does. Maybe we can add a little something to his work of art. Scant nodded. Yes, no not a problem. I'll go tonight. Opal stretched out on the sofa like a cat in the sunlight. Good. This has turned out to be a lovely day. Now send for the surgeon. The Brill brothers glanced at each other. Miss Cowboy, said Merville nervously. Yes, what is it? The surgeon, this kind of operation cannot be reversed, even by magic. Are you sure you wouldn't like to think? Obo leaped from the sofa. Her cheeks were crimson with rage. Think? You'd like me to think about it? What do you imagine I've been doing for the past year? Thinking. 24 hours a day. I don't care about magic. Magic did not help me escape. Science did. Science will be my magic. Now no more in my verve, or your brother will be an only child. Is that clear? Merv was stunned. He'd never seen Opal in such a rage. The coma had changed her. Yes, Miss Cowboy. Now summon the surgeon. At once, Miss Cowboy. Opal lay back on the sofa. Soon everything would be right in the world. Her enemies would shortly be dead or discredited. Once those loose ends were tied up, she could get on with her new life. Cowboy rubbed the tips of her pointed ears. What would she look like, she wondered, as a human?